Today I'm speaking with James Doty. James is a professor of neurosurgery at Stanford University and the director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism Research and Education. He is also a philanthropist who has funded health clinics throughout the world and has endowed scholarships and chairs at multiple universities. And he also serves on the board of a number of nonprofits. And as you'll hear, he has a very unusual background. He grew up in real poverty and faced a number of challenges and seemed by no means guaranteed to succeed in life. But as you can hear, he has accomplished quite a lot. So we talk about how he did that and how we might better understand and facilitate the human capacity to overcome obstacles and bring more compassion into our lives and to generally make the world a better place. And now I bring you James Doty. I am here with James Doty. Jim, thanks for joining me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be with you. Thanks for uh, having me. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about how you came to be the Jim Doty who's, who's now speaking with me, but um, <laughs> tell me how you summarize uh, what you're up to now. I'm a uh, professor of neurosurgery at Stanford. Probably more germane for our conversation is I'm the uh, founder and director of the Center for Compassion and Altruism, which is part of the School of Medicine, and of which the Dalai Lama is actually the founding benefactor. And uh, I'm also an inventor and entrepreneur and philanthropist at times. And I have really an interest actually in what drives people to be good, if you will. Okay, well, let's begin at the beginning. You've written a very poignant memoir, Into the Magic Shop, which covers your childhood, which really is not the usual childhood, or I can only imagine it's not the usual childhood for someone who who has the breadth of your your life experience at this point. I mean, the, your memoir, is, it's almost like a fairy tale of challenges. I mean, just it entailed an incredible amount of stress in your earliest years. Your father was an alcoholic. Your mother was clinically depressed and often suicidally depressed. And then you had this transformation based on an encounter you had in a magic shop, literally a magic shop. So let's talk about how you began this journey of yours in life. How would you describe your childhood and, and what happened in the magic shop? Sure. Well, of course, when a child grows up in poverty with a father who's an alcoholic, a mother who's uh, had a stroke, par partially paralyzed, clinically depressed, the big factor is that in some ways you're in a war zone all the time because you never know what's going to happen. You know, I wouldn't know whether my father was going to not come home or come home drunk or whether I would come in from school and my mother would be passed out from an overdose and I would have to call an ambulance. So, of course, when you grow up in that type of an environment, it's quite chaotic. And as you know, uh, there's something called adverse childhood experiences. And this is essentially a technique where you sort of collect these events that a child lives with uh, growing up, poverty, drug and alcohol abuse, mental illness, et cetera. And the higher the number, the less likely that child is going to, if you will, succeed by societal norms and more likely that the child themselves will have drug and alcohol abuse and mental illness and a variety of other obvious negative events happen in their life. And at the age of 12, I was filled with hopelessness, despair, anger, and obviously it was affecting me. And in fact, I was becoming a juvenile delinquent. And I had had an interest in magic. And what would happen is when an event would happen at home that was not particularly pleasant, I would get on my Stingray bike and ride as far away as possible. And on one of those adventures, I happened by a strip mall, and at the strip mall was a magic store, which I went into. And the thing was that when I walked in, of course, my interest was in magic in the store, 
And there was a woman sitting there who had long flowing gray hair and her glasses on the tip of her nose and a chain around her glasses reading a paperback. And she looked up at me and um, she had this really extraordinarily radiant smile. And I asked her about the magic that I was interested in. And she said, well, I don't know anything about this. This is my son's store. I'm just here for the summer. But this led us really to a, a conversation that ended up being quite deep and one, frankly, which I wasn't used to. And the reason the conversation happened was because this is a person who made me feel psychologically safe. I wasn't fearful of her. I wasn't fearful that I was being judged. And mm. she actually spoke to me as if I was an equal and that my opinion actually meant something, which for a child from my background was somewhat unusual. Yeah. And so, so I mean, we'll talk about meditation and compassion and uh, all of these interests that you, you and I have in common. And your, obviously your connection to training the mind was initiated in, in this dialogue with, with Ruth in the magic shop. But what she was teaching you was not, in some ways it was kind of a standard meditation practices, but in other ways it, it wasn't. How would you summarize what she taught you there? Well, I think there were four parts. And, and I have to tell you, I mean, when she offered over the period of the six weeks to meet with me and, if you will, train me, which isn't really what she called it, but I actually, you know, had some concerns even about showing up. And I showed up not because I had self-awareness or insight. I showed up because she was giving me cookies. And frankly, I mm -hmm. had absolutely nothing else to do. But I did show up. And the first thing she taught me, which is a technique that now we would call a body survey and, and a breathing technique. And I did not appreciate that when you're stressed and you're anxious and your mind is all over the place, uh, that with intention, doing this technique of relaxing the body and then slowly breathing in and releasing your breath really had a profound physiologic effect. This was in 1968. And of course, terms like mindfulness or meditation or neuroplasticity were certainly not commonly used at all. And after a few weeks of doing this practice, I felt in some ways, much calmer. And it was interesting because while the first few weeks, I didn't really notice anything, as I did it more, I did notice something. And But one of the things I was having challenges with was as I did this and sat with my own silence, I would have this negative dialogue going on in my head. And it was one that said I wasn't good enough. I wasn't smart enough, et cetera, et cetera. And what she explained to me was that that dialogue was not truth and that negative commentary, if you will, sticks to us because they're the things that potentially put us at risk. And that, in fact, that negative commentary could be changed. And this is what she called training the mind or taming the mind. And uh, basically, it's what we would now call self-compassion, this technique that has been advocated by Krista Neff and others, to be kind to yourself. I realized that I was always beating myself up and blaming myself for my situation. And so with that technique, and she described it as listening to a radio station, if you will, that you could change it. I changed it from one of negativity to one of self-affirmation and self-acceptance. And that, in fact, I was worthy. I did tell people that when you make these types of negative comments to yourself, it's as if you're laying these bricks down that are creating a self-imposed prison and very much giving your power away or agency away to change things in your life. Because every time you say, I can't, it's not possible, the reality is that. 
And I did not even understand that at the time. And so by changing that dialogue was extraordinarily helpful to me for a couple reasons. One is many of us have a shadow self that we don't want to admit to and things that we don't like about ourselves, things that disgust us about ourselves, our failings. And for many people, they have a tendency to try to push it away from them or hide it somewhere. And it doesn't go away. And in fact, when you're troubled or have difficulties, that's when it shows itself. And this is where you can relate it to addiction. When you're particularly stressed, that addiction comes out. And so she taught me to accept that as a part of me and don't deny it and just be aware of it. And the other thing is that because I was so critical of myself, it made me hypercritical of everything and everyone around me. And what I found is that because of that, when I interacted with others or tried to accomplish something, I would take a negative view of it. And what I didn't appreciate is that human beings have this unique ability to intuit emotional states from facial expressions, voice intonation, body habitus, even smells. And when you carry yourself in that fashion, people don't want to be around you or they shy away or they're not open and they're not generous. Mm. And as a result, what I tell people is that when I changed how I looked at myself and it changed how the world interacted with me. The other side effect of that was that I carried a lot of anger and hostility towards my personal situation, my parents. And of course, that was not fruitful in any way. And what happened was that I was able to see them in a much different way. I saw them as human beings who had their own pain and suffering, and the tools that they had to deal with them were not effective at all. You know, hiding your pain behind alcohol or, you know, taking pills to get rid of the pain and hoping that it would keep it away isn't helpful. And I, in some ways, forgave them and accepted the situation not trying to hope the situation would be different. And that change in perspective, which I think is important in a lot of these practices, is really very, very important. Well, she taught you something else in the magic shop, which on the surface can sound pretty spooky. I mean, it's in line with what you just described generically in terms of changing your concept of yourself. I mean, she asked you to list what you want in life and to visualize yourself having it. I mean, to really inhabit the person who already has these things, whether it's great wealth or great success, or you had a list of things which was fairly adorable for a 12 year old. I mean, they, <laughs> including, you know, having a Porsche and a Rolex. But she wanted you to not see it from the outside, but really see it from the inside and to practice this visualization that, that really this is a fait accompli. You're guaranteed to arrive at the desired station in life. And what you need to do now is inhabit the, the psychology of that and make it real for yourself. And you know, as you, you walk a line in, in your description of this that is, to my eye, on, on the right side of, of rational here because it, there's a rational way to understand how this can benefit a person, but it could also just tip into sounding like The Secret. I don't know if you remember that, oh, no, that no. book and that movie, the movie by the name that is the appropriate target of opprobrium at the center of new age irrationality. But the idea that if you just visualize things or think it's true or assert that it's true, it will become true, whether it's you know attaining wealth or losing weight or anything else. But you know, describe to me how you think about the power of visualizing certain outcomes and how that enforces change in one's basic neurology uh, or one's associated behavior and the kinds of you know opportunities that present themselves in life. Sure. No, I think you're right. I, I will be frank with you. I'm not a fan of the secret or the Celestine prophecies. 
et cetera. You know, I don't believe that there's a magic external power and we just need to tap into it and everything will be wonderful. What I do believe, and in some ways I said earlier, is that each of us has extraordinary power. We just don't realize it. And, you know, negative self dialogue uh, limits that power. What she taught me and what I realize is that when you utilize your senses, and I think we see this in now sports psychology, you know, people think about the athletic event they're going to do over and over and over again. And the reality is, as an example, you know, it's been shown in a variety of studies that when you think about, as an example, lifting weights, you actually increase to a small degree your muscle mass just by thinking about it. And when you repeat something in your head over and over and over again, it starts setting down neural pathways. And when you utilize all your senses to do that, you write it down, you read it, you verbalize it, you think about it, et cetera, et cetera, then I would say that if there is a possibility of it happening, that is the best technique to help that manifest. And I'll give you an interesting example. As a neurosurgeon, of course, I see a lot of patients who have a variety of conditions, but most of the patients who see me will say something like, wow, doctor, I've never heard of that. And then I see them a few months later and they go, you know, it's the most amazing thing. Since we talked about it, I found that I have that. I've run into five people who in fact do have that. And the reason is, is because you have put a subconscious primer out there and they're now attuned to that. And in many ways, this is like uh, the technique that Ruth taught me. I put into my subconscious this idea, this possibility, this potential opportunity, and then I am attuned to events that will allow that to occur. I don't know if you've seen the book by a guy named Bob Neese. It's called The Power of 50 Bits. Mm, no. Well, the premise is as follows, is that we have about six to 10 million sensory inputs happening every second, but we're really only able to process about 50 or 100. And so when you put these things into your subconscious, in some ways you're creating a folder with that thing in it that sits out there, and that's one of the things that you're going to pay attention to but it's not necessarily on a conscious level. And I think that is how you're able to have these things manifest. But it's not, you know, praying to a power and hoping it happens. There's actually a process here. And, you know, if you look at the placebo effect, if you look at how different individuals are able to make things happen. As an example, of course, we know monks who can control their heart rate or their body temperature. All of these things are available to us. It's how do you get access to it and mm. what's the best way to get access to it to have it manifest? Yeah, well, there's a fact here which explains a lot of this, and it's that the brain on some level, doesn't know the difference between what's real and what is merely a simulation. I mean, the, the brain is a, a kind of simulation machine, and the dreaming brain and the waking brain share a fair amount of real estate apart from their frontal reality testing mode that kind of goes offline when you're dreaming. So to visualize something vividly is not nothing for the brain, right? It is you are training something, and there are many levels of this phenomenon we can witness, you know, some deliberate and some not. I mean, the change you noticed in your patients, you know, everyone has noticed in their lives when they decide they're, they're looking for a new car or they're looking for a new anything, that class of objects in the world suddenly becomes super salient to them, and they're noticing that brand of car or that type of dog or, or anything else that they have suddenly become interested in. They're noticing that thing everywhere, and it, it looks like there's been a change in the frequency out in the world, but no, it's just you're just filtering based on that class of information. It should be very easy to see how negative self-concepts become a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. If you think you're the kind of person who 
isn't good at parties, can't socialize effectively with people, a person who no one likes. Well, if that's your self-talk, you can imagine just what you're ramifying in relationship with people out in the world and the way that becomes self-perpetuating. And the opposite, obviously, can become the case. And what you're describing as a practice of kind of seizing the reins deliberately and jump-starting a virtuous cycle of self-fulfillment in just changing the, your self-concept. No, I think that's exactly right. And, and, you know, what's so unfortunate is that this is free and available to everyone. And what's unfortunate is, as you point out, people get into these cycles of these uh, negative emotional states and ruminate on them. And again, unfortunately, it just reinforces that. Again, I was fortunate in that with Ruth's intervention, if you will, that changed everything. And it made me see the issue wasn't me. The issue was my negative self-talk. And once I got over that and truly believed, if you will, of infinite possibilities, then that allowed a whole series of events to happen. Well, so then you went on to go to college, as improbable as that seemed, given your background. And it really did seem improbable, even even with all your visualization, you sort of barely got an application in hand. And then you not only w went to college, you went on to become a, a neurosurgeon. Let's talk for a few minutes about the choice to become a neurosurgeon. I, I, I actually you know, have, a, as you know, a PhD in neuroscience, but right. I don't know too many neurosurgeons well. I mean, I, I know a few, but in terms of actual friends who are neurosurgeons. So what I know about the culture of neurosurgery is from the outside. I, mean, I remember reading this book a while back, uh, When the Air Hits Your Brain. I don't know if you ever read yes. that book by yes. Vertisic. Uh, you know, I, I don't know how faithfully he captures th the culture, but he really does paint the culture of neurosurgeons as a kind of culture of gunslingers and frat boys. It seems to be a, a specialty that selects for a kind of high testosterone arrogance and you, you and your, you know, certainly in your residency, as you were, as your visualizations were actually working, there was a, a fair amount of arrogance that came online for you. Tell me what it was like to become a neurosurgeon and, and how you view that field of expertise. Well, I would say that over the last uh, number of years, the, that has changed somewhat, mm. but, but you're, you're right. I mean, this is a group of people and who, are comfortable with somebody's life in their hands, realizing that a false move can destroy someone's life. And with that power in some ways, for many people comes a sense of arrogance and a belief of infallibility. And, um, and so, of course, the system selects for those types of people. The other interesting thing about it is, of course, not only do you have to be intelligent, hopefully you have good judgment and technical abilities. That's not always the case. But the thing for many of these people is most decided they were going to be a neurosurgeon, I mean, literally in high school or early in college. And it was this driving force that made them want to be a neurosurgeon. My situation was quite a bit different in that I was actually interested in plastic surgery, specifically in caring for children who had craniofacial deformities. And I thought being a neurosurgeon would be helpful for that. I realized I, I wasn't that interested in general surgery, which is usually the path to then do a fellowship in plastic surgery. So I was, if you will, very late to the game and it was never a burning desire of mine to be a neurosurgeon for the typical reasons. So my view was somewhat different. But I would also suggest it's an extraordinarily demanding specialty. And I tell people, in, if there is absolutely nothing else you can imagine yourself doing, that's great, become a neurosurgeon. Otherwise, if there's anything that interests you beyond that, you should do that because this is a lot of hours and hours of training. I mean, neurosurgery is now seven years. 
certainly if you're going into academics or many people just regardless to a fellowship of one to two to three years. So you're now 10, to, 10 years down the road from college, and it's a specialty that uh, requires intense focus, an immense amount of diligence, and frankly, heartache. Nothing is you know, more painful than to you know, have to tell someone that their loved one either is devastated, didn't survive, you weren't able to do what you were going to do. Now, interestingly, I, I know colleagues who, for them, those types of statements are just another day at work. And it's mm. like, uh, you know, water on a duck's back. For me, I take it much more personally. Mm. Yeah, I can hear. So, yeah, I, I wanted to ask you about that because, uh, you know, obviously we're, we're now getting to the topic of compassion. And I'm, I was wondering how much your experience as a surgeon, which really, again, from the outside, I mean, any kind of surgeon, but I, get, I think a neurosurgeon is maybe the ultimate example of this and, and a pediatric neurosurgeon. I mean, one, one of your, the beginning of your memoir puts us in the OR where you're operating on a brain tumor in a child. I just can imagine having those conversations with parents you know, who are understandably in extremis. I mean, this is the height of, of fear, of uncertainty before surgery, and obviously in, in those cases where it goes well, that has to be a joy second to none. But when it doesn't go well, that has to be truly harrowing. You just raised the topic that I was wondering about. If compassion, and again, we, we, we need to talk about compassion and define it and differentiate it from other states of mind, but before we get there, I'm just wondering if, if compassion is the only tool you need to navigate moments like that, or if, if there's something you know, less ideal. I, mean, I can imagine there's, there's almost a kind of benevolent or fortuitous psychopathy that comes online for many surgeons where it's just like this is just the job, right? You can't take this to heart every time or even generally because this will destroy you if you're moved around too much by the outcomes here. And it sounds like some surgeons do this to a fault. They're kind of checked out emotionally around the reality of the situation for the parents or for the patients. How do you view the, the range of emotions that are ideal in this circumstance, and how do you, how do you navigate that? Well, it's interesting because it is a, a broad range. There's a subset of people who, frankly, may be on the Asperger spectrum, who they're great technicians, they're, they know the literature, et cetera, et cetera. They have no emotional connection, and it is a job, and they do the job, and then they're gone. And of course, if you're talking about a, a, a doctor-patient relationship, there isn't one. And I've even had people say, well, I know, he, you know he's not very nice and he's abrupt and brusque and arrogant, but he's a good surgeon. Okay. And then you have you know, the other extreme where someone's highly engaging, very sensitive and connected and suffers with you. But the key is to be able to understand the limits of your abilities. And as long as you can tell yourself, I prepared and did the best I can, then there's no more of a discussion. That's all you can do and you're okay. And I think in my mind, of course, that would be the ideal situation. As in my book, I talked about a woman who was an opera singer who had a, an aneurysm which is a dilatation of a blood vessel in the brain near her speech area, and asked me to operate on her. And by this time, uh, she had seen a few other people. We had become friends. And when I had the aneurysm exposed, and really, literally, it truly was about to rupture, you could see the blood swirling in, in the aneurysm because it was, so, was paper-thin. And during that moment, I started thinking about her versus the technical aspects of uh, doing that job. And my hand started shaking to the point where I had to stop and actually go into a meditation 
to essentially become a technician and displace my emotional connection to her out of the picture. And once I was able to do that, I was a then able to effectively treat her and she did fine. And that's really one of the few instances where connecting with their humanity does not allow you to do your job. And that mm -hmm. is a job of being a technician. Well, let's talk about, I think I, I do want to touch on your kind of the other side of your career where you, you've been an entrepreneur and someone who has, you know, run a company and had kind of interesting adventures in, in wealth and philanthropy. <laughs> we'll jump to that after we talk about compassion and, and how you came to focus on it and just what it is. I mean, how, how did compassion first become a primary focus of yours and what is it? How do you think about it as a, a mental state and capacity? Well, on some level, I, it was always there. I just didn't quite understand what it meant. But what had happened was at one point, I had left Stanford and, and I had been intermittently involved with Stanford since I think 97. But I had left to run an entrepreneurial company. Then the dot com crisis came and I used to consult for setting up, if you will, neuroscience centers of excellence and went to a hospital in Mississippi and ultimately agreed to actually go there to build this program for them. But during that time, I had an experience with a, a child who was not cared for adequately and as a result had an infection in his brain and an abscess and his parents waited too long to bring him in. And he, even with my best efforts, he died. But it put me into a period of reflection about all of these things. And when I went back to Stanford, I decided to explore this a little more and try to understand it. And um, interestingly, when I initially talked to my colleagues at Stanford in psychology and neuroscience, actually, I was told that the academic exploration of compassion was a dead end and that if anyone made that the center of their academic endeavors, they were not going to go very far. Hmm. The fortunate thing was that I had some financial resources, which allowed me to fund what we initially called Project Compassion, which brought a group of psychologists and neuroscientists together. And we started a journal club looking at the literature and then did some studies. And really, it was evident that actually these practices, or if you will, the nature of compassion was quite profound in regard to how it affects your emotional state, how it can affect your physiology, and a whole variety of both brain and peripheral physiology measures. And this led to the creation, ultimately, of a compassion cultivation training program, which we did some studies on, and also, I think, led to some interesting studies. And, uh, and then, of course, uh, over time, and I think if you look over the last 12 to 15 years, this idea of the importance of compassion combined with our already significant interest in mindfulness practices really is one of the things that are at the forefront. I mean, years and years ago when we started this, you would talk about compassion. And for many people, it was completely poo-pooed, especially by the corporate community, because mm. it's looked as a form of weakness. You know, people run over you if you're too nice, if you're compassionate. And I think now people recognize that it is, in fact, extraordinarily powerful. Yeah. So let's talk about what the mental state is, because it's often conflated with empathy and sympathy and pity and it needs to be differentiated even from something that's integral to it with something like loving kindness it also gets operationalized differently in different studies so that the neuroscience as far as i can tell is still a little fuzzy because some studies they're done in irreconcilable ways i mean it's some ask people just to generate the state of loving kindness essentially without any stimuli and then some present subjects with images of human suffering to which they they respond and and so it, i think that at least in my view the generic 
definition of compassion is loving kindness in the presence of suffering, where, where, where su human suffering or animal suffering is taken as its object, and it includes this desire, this motivation to alleviate the suffering of others. It has a few things bundled in here. It's directly cognizant of suffering, so it has a kind of cognitive empathy, but it doesn't have the same kind of emotional contagion. It's not like you're sad when the object of your compassion is sad, or you're depressed when the object of your compassion is depressed. It's a highly pro-social and, and even positive emotion. I mean, it's not morbid. It's not a, a state of collapse. You're not feeling diminished psychologically by proximity to the suffering of others. In fact, it's an expansive state that has the feeling tone of loving kindness, but it has this extra topspin of wanting to respond to the suffering of others by alleviating that suffering. Does that make uh, I sense? Think, yeah, I think you're exactly right. I, I, I think, you know, if you were to make a, a graph and you put agency and effort on one and you put understanding and engagement on the other, sort of in the downward left corner would be pity. And this is, I'm sorry for you, or, and it's invariably related to, I'm superior to you. I appreciate mm -hmm. your situation. It has nothing to do with empathy or anything else. It simply has to do with your recognizing it. And it, you know, you feel bad for them, but doesn't reply, imply you're going to do anything for them. While sympathy is less than empathy, it's, I, on a cognitive level, if you will, understand that you're in pain and I feel for you, but it requires no agency per se. While empathy is actually, you know, taking on the emotional state of another, and, but it has no valence. It can, you can have empathic joy and mm. that can feel very good or as Mathieu Ricard uh, will describe, who's a Buddhist monk who you, I'm sure you probably know, he yeah. says, when you know, I take on pain and feel for the other's pain, it is so painful to myself that I, you know, I can barely stand it. Compassion is different in the sense that it is associated with suffering. It requires you to take on that emotional state, but you have a very strong motivational desire to alleviate that suffering. And I think that's really the key there is that you are motivated to alleviate that suffering. Now, interestingly, Jamil Zaki, who wrote a book on kindness recently, says empathy is the same as compassion, or he uses them interchangeably. He and I have had mm. some discussions about that, but uh, I think some people do have a tendency to use that, but I would not use it that way. Yeah, the, the terminology here is uncertain enough that even my friend Paul Bloom could write a book against empathy, differentiating two different types of empathy, you know, one of which I, I agree with him is not a good guide for moral deliberation, which is, the again, just more this pure emotional contagion side of it, which is you know just being taken in by suffering and feeling it as your own, but in a way that is causing you to actually not be able to respond effectively or even think rationally about what would help you know their problem has become your problem and you know you're you're yet another drowning person who doesn't know how to swim and needs to be rescued yes uh, so then how did you get connected with the dalai lama and other buddhists in this vein yeah so and this may sound like magical thinking and i hate to do that to you i was involved in this work with these scientists and we had begun some initial research studies and we were thinking about having a conference and i was walking through the stanford campus one day and again literally an image of the dalai lama came into my head and frankly i had zero interest in the dalai lama per se and more interestingly my wife was a huge fan and in fact she had bought tickets for us to go to an event, and I actually refused to go because it, mm. it didn't interest me. But for some reason, this image stayed in my head, and I decided that it would be good to 
invite the Dalai Lama to this conference that we were thinking about doing. And he had been at Stanford once previously discussing addiction and craving. And I tracked down the person in Buddhist studies who had invited him and then connected him to one of His Holiness's translators, who had a PhD from Cambridge and um, uh, was a former monk. And Is ulti- that that's Tipton Jimpa? Or? Exactly, yes, yes. Yeah. And, uh, and Jimpa then arranged for this meeting. And, uh, and so at this meeting, and it's always interesting how things go because it was just me with this idea. But when I was meeting with the Dalai Lama, we had the dean of the medical school, the associate dean, you know, it became an entourage. And um, we met with him and his holiness, as you know, was very interested in neuroscience and uh, was very, very interested in this topic and was immediately engaged in our 15 minute uh, conversation ended up, or that was scheduled, ended up being an hour and a half. And at the end of it, he began a very animated conversation with Upton Jinpa. And I thought actually I'd somehow irritated or uh, you know, made the Dalai Lama angry, which of course mm. is a very embarrassing thing to do. That, that would be a feat. That's, uh, <laughs> I would take that as a feather in your cap. Yes, uh, 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 it. <laughs> although I, I have seen him angry. Yeah. But at the end of this animated dialogue, Jinpa turned to me and he said, His Holiness is so moved by this effort that he wants to make a contribution. And at that moment, he made the largest donation to a non-Tibetan cause he had ever made, which shocked uh, everyone there. And I was quite overwhelmed and moved myself. And then Shortly thereafter, two other individuals made significant donations, and that actually created the center. Nice, nice. And, and how much time have you spent around him since? Have you met him on multiple occasions? Yes, actually. Many occasions in different parts of the world, I've spent time with him and have chatted with him. Ultimately, I also became chairman of the Dalai Lama Foundation for several years. Mm. So I was fairly involved with him. And it's interesting because we're talking about emotional states. I can understand why people want to be near him. And in some ways, it's like what Ruth offered me, which is unconditional acceptance and love without qualification. And very few people actually give that out in a in an interaction with them. And when you're in his presence, what I tell people is that in modern society, which is different than how we lived a few hundred years ago, a few hundred years ago, we lived in a village. We typically had multi-generations in the village. Everyone knew you from the time you were a child to growing up. You didn't move away. You had an incredible support system. You had a community. And that community is extraordinarily important to your mental and physical health, I think. And in modern society, we don't have that at all. Uh, you don't have your parents around. You don't have your siblings. You don't have loved ones in proximity. And so as a result, we have a tendency to create these shields that we carry around, which are the ones that say, I'm this, I'm that, I've accomplished this, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. But there's no true authenticity that is ever released. And when you're with somebody like the Dalai Lama, you know immediately that you are unconditionally accepted and loved. And it's really quite profound because when that happens, it's almost as if this weight is lifted off of you and this natural joy and exuberance about being alive in some ways is released. And so I think, you know, when you look at people who strive to be near these types of individuals, uh, you can perfectly understand why. Yeah, it is still somewhat mysterious to explain, but it is, it's a genuine phenomenon. I, mean, I have spent a lot of time with great meditation masters, and, uh, you know, I spent some considerable time, albeit briefly focused over the course of a month with the Dalai Lama. I met him on a, a number of occasions, but I strangely 
got to be one of his bodyguards for a trip <laughs> for a trip through France. Uh, uh, so he 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 was he was on a kind of a teaching tour of France, and for whatever reason, I got to be part of the the Buddhist retinue that was the buffer between the real security guards. When he's in France, he get or at least at that point he got you know their version of Secret Service protection, something he he did not get in the United States. And so there were like four guys with guns who were you know really protecting him. But then there was this buffer of essentially students of meditation and and you know people who had sat three year retreats in France with various lamas, and there were maybe twelve of us. And ironically, you know we had the most conflict with the general public because we were the buffer between the real bodyguards and and the public. It was a surreal experience to walk into a room more or less continually focused on what could go wrong, who was untrustworthy, just basically radiating bad vibes of, <laughs> of suspicion everywhere. And to have over your shoulder the Dalai Lama beaming unconditional acceptance and love and just general ease. And it was, I must say, it was a bad job. Certainly not where one wanted to be in, in one's thinking alongside him but is where one had to be i mean because he really does sure. did have security concerns and it's amazing the number of weird people who show up when his presence is announced somewhere but it, would, it, it gave me a chance to spend some time with him and, and see what he was like again and again and again mingling with strangers of all sorts and yeah he's a he's a very impressive person in that way he does have a kind of laser focus on just connecting with people you know you know albeit very briefly i mean he'll walk into a, the lobby of a a hotel and there'll be 40 people hoping to catch his attention and he moves from one to the other in a very systematic way and gives everyone a moment and it's pretty amazing i think that's absolutely right and and it shows you how he is absolutely in the present moment and what's interesting though is i would add a couple things and not to imply that this is an act in any way, but, you know, when he's on stage and he's, you know, the Dalai Lama for so many people, he does sort of emote this feeling of unconditional love. But that being said, he's also absolutely focused and present and attending. And it's sort of interesting to watch that, uh, the power of that. And the other aspect of it is that I've been fortunate because of the work that I've done to meet a number of spiritual and religious leaders, whether it's uh, Amma, the hugging saint, I don't mm -hmm. know if you yeah, know her. Yeah. yeah, or Sri Sri, Ravi Shankar, or Sadhguru, or Radhana Swami, or, you know, a, tr <laughs> a litany of these people. And you know, the vast majority of them also have this sort of presence like that where they lift you beyond yourself and you feel that you, the potential is, you know, for you to embrace this and to become better. And I think that's a wonderful ability these individuals have. The other thing I would comment, though, is that because people say to me, you know, I don't understand how you're not a follower of theirs yet, for whatever reason, these people seem to embrace you. And what I tell people is that these people can intuit someone's agenda, if you will, in a microsecond. And it's not about the dogma of their religion. It's about, do you care? Do you love? Are you compassionate? Because that's what they're interested in. And while the dogma is one thing, these people, if you will, are above that dogma also in many ways, I think. Yeah, we should say there's an impressive framing effect here where it's, I mean, once you've been told that someone is worthy of your attention and you grant your attention to them in this way, you're told this person is you know, a great saint or this person just spent 20 years in a cave meditating, all of the hardware and software of projection gets tuned up and it's it's very easy to contribute to the experience one is having in their presence and obviously there's you know you, you can flip that around if your expectation is that somebody is a dangerous lunatic and he only thinks he's 
a saint, if that's the framing, well, then you'll have a different experience around them, presumably. But there's just no question that when you're talking about somebody who really is a, a great meditation master or someone who's just a, a supremely ethical person, that comes through and charisma seems to kind of trivialize it, but there's a kind of charisma that comes through with many of these people which can fairly bowl you over if you're at all available to notice it. Yeah, and I would say, as you point out, there is a, this aspect of priming, if you will, where you know you are anticipating something and your brain then sort of creates the narrative. But the interesting thing about that, in some ways, it shows you how reframing situations changes everything. Mm. Yeah. I give an example of two individuals walk out of an office building into the rain. One individual is, and they're both wearing suits, ties, et cetera. One individual says, wow, the, the warmth of the rain, it reminds me of growing up and, you know, how it nurtures life on earth and, you know, creates this whole narrative about the power of rain, et cetera, et cetera, right? They just go on and they're just happy because it's reminded them of good things in their lives. And you have another guy who walks out and says, God damn rain, you know, I'm so pissed off. I'm supposed to be at a meeting. I'm going to be late. I have to get a cab. And, you know, both of these individuals have experienced the identical event, yet how they process that event is dramatically different. And in some ways, that is our possibilities for being happy, frankly. Yeah, I mean, it really is the power of thought. On one level, it can sound spooky, but on another level, it's just obvious that virtually everything that differentiates us from our next of kin among the apes attests to the power of thinking, and it is what makes us human and determines more or less everything we do, everything we expect, everything we attempt, and, and, and we spend basically every waking moment having a conversation with ourselves about the nature of the world and our place in it. And for the most part, unless you learn to meditate or try to learn to meditate, you don't even notice that about yourself all too clearly. And yet it's, it's still having its determinative effect moment by moment. No, I think that's right. And in some ways, though, I, I think meditation is a luxury for many people. Mm. If you are on the lowest level of Maslow's hierarchy and you're just trying to get food and survive, you know, having the time and actually the ability to sit down and think about that is not a possibility for most people. And I think you have to be at a certain level, if you will, to be able to appreciate it. And I think the other side of it is that meditation is wonderful for a subset of people. The, I think, challenge, though, is that it's often an attempt, though, especially in, uh, in the last many years, especially among corporations, is to take a, the ills of society, stress, anxiety, which are fundamentally structural issues that have been created oftentimes and attempt to use this technique to get rid of problems that aren't inherently what that technique was necessarily made for. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah. There's sort of a paradox lurking here because I, I think meditation can really work even in emergencies and even for people who have no apparent advantages. I mean, like if you look at the kinds of people who are wandering shoeless in the Himalayas doing nothing but practice meditation, you know, sadhus. And you know, traditionally, it's not people who have actualized everything or acquired everything you could want in life and only then decide it's not enough and they become introspective. So it, it can be valuable at every point along the way. But yeah, it, it is just, in fact, true that we have personal and social problems that are born of bad systems, bad incentives, 
breakdowns in, in institutions. And for most people, most of the time, it seems, or in fact, it is so that there are so many problems that need to be solved before they have the free attention to even think about doing something like practicing meditation or exercising for their health or, you know, eating well. I mean, there's just, we have systemic societal emergencies to respond to, which I, perhaps we should talk about. I mean, this is, this does connect to the topic of compassion. I mean, compassion is good for us personally. I mean, there's, there's a positive physiology here, which we, which we could touch on, but it's also just as an impulse, it is what society needs. If we're talking about the United States or the, the developed world generally, we're talking about societies that still show an impressive degree of inequality. I mean, it's something you know directly based on your childhood. And the desire to respond to that, leave aside what is, in fact, will be an effective response to that. I mean, that good people can disagree about what is effective, but the willingness to respond to it, the impulse to respond to it, the sense that it that there are unconscionable disparities in luck in this world. I mean, that is, compassion is the, the mental state that would surface that willingness to respond. And let's talk about inequality and, and how you view compassion's role in bettering our society and, and our personal lives. You can take either, you can take both sides of that. First of all, getting back to your sadhu statement, mm -hmm. there's a, uh, you know, when you talk about sadhus in India who are focused on religious or, uh, you know, these practices, that is that is a culture that accepts those people. And mm -hmm. in fact, uh, some people worship those people. You know, you don't have many sadhus in, you know, Cleveland no, we, we, or, or... We call them homeless, homeless people. Or, yeah, exactly. You, people aren't going up to them going, thank you for your sacrifice. Right. So well, that's, I, 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 I should think, also say that, parenthetically, that I acknowledge that many sadhus are, in fact, maniacs of one sort or, yes. or another. So yes, it's, not, I, not every, it's not everyone wearing <laughs> orange or ochre is, is worthy of your veneration in India. Yeah, yeah. well, that's a whole another discussion. Right. But uh, yeah, getting back to, I think compassion is the antidote, but it struggles against several forces that diminish that compassion. One is, and you can look at the work of uh, Dacher Keltner and mm -hmm. others, that as you become more affluent, your empathy decreases. And what I mean by that is most of us who function in society, it is required that we have, if you want to call it a quid pro quo, but where you understand that your effectiveness in society in some ways is a result of others respecting you and being kind to you. And the thing is, once you get to a certain level of influence, you don't need that at all. You just replace the person. Hmm. And as a result, the empathy of the very wealthy is markedly diminished. They look at you as just a replaceable thing to provide a service. And in some ways, uh, this is how people are treated in certain corporate environments. Uh, you're just a, a replaceable. And that's why you look oftentimes where CEOs of companies or some of the people in financial or private equity you know, they have no problem destroying a company, taking every penny out of it, and walking away. They're not living with what it's like to be unemployed or to not have enough to eat or to worry about your children. And I think, unfortunately, that is a big separation. And sadly, what happens to so many people is that the very wealthy live in an echo chamber. Hmm. And the echo chamber says, well, the reason the situation's like that is they created it. The reason the situation's like that is they didn't work hard enough. And this is why, and I think uh, we had a previous discussion, that uh, there's a quote by Tolstoy that says, uh, there's a monkey on your back. I'm 
there's an individual on your back who is choking you. And the entire time, he's telling you how sorry he feels for you, but at no time does he ever offer to get off your back and stop choking you. And what I mean that by that is this type of self-interest by a subset of society won't change unless there's something, unfortunately, I think that forces them to change. Now, it could be a self-realization that increase in income inequality is ultimately going to make their life very miserable at some point. But in general, I think uh, it's, it's a very big challenge. Don't get me wrong, there are individuals who do wonderful things and very wealthy people who've done extraordinary things to help others. But I would say a much larger percentage of people, frankly, it's self-interest and it's self-interest to do enough where people won't protest enough. What I find interesting is over the last several decades, when America has been its most prosperous, we have not seen the significant improvement in people's lives. You know, we don't talk mm. about a living wage. We talk about a minimum wage. We don't have uh, health insurance for everyone. We don't have daycare. We don't have free education. Yet, here, the working class who's really built this country is profoundly suffering, especially now in the face of this pandemic. Yet, many in the billionaire class are only reaping in more and more massive profits. And uh, I think. Ultimately, this needs to be addressed. You know, people talk about Davos and you have, you know, the wealthiest people who all sit in the echo chamber. And what is it? There's only 3,000 or so billionaires around and then another probably 30,000 people at the next tier. And they get together and they talk about, you know, the problems of society. Well, who gave them the right to decide how society works or the pro how to solve the problems? Because when you only have that group solving the problem, then that group makes the rules. And typically, those rules minimally affect them. And I think that's a whole, whole other issue. You know, when you have, as an example, we're talking about some of these practices to decrease stress, anxiety, have emotion regulation. Well, you know, if, if you're hungry at school because you don't have enough to eat, it's hard to, you know, have attention to stay in school. If you, you live in a very chaotic home environment where there's violence, it, it's really hard to look at the world in a different way. And so, again, you know, we have band-aids that try to help these things, but I think there's a fundamental need for, if you will, a compassion revolution where we look at every one of these uh, aspects of society and try to create a kinder, gentler society. And unfortunately, that's going to come from all the stakeholders being involved, not just a very small percentage of people who, through position of wealth, decide they're the ones who know. Well, th there's a pernicious mythology here around the, the notion of being a self-made person. There are many, many rich people, by no means everyone, but I would say something like a majority, who fall prey to this notion that they are really responsible for their success. And it makes absolutely no sense, no matter how self-made a person is on the surface. I mean, you, I mean you're among the most self-made people I, I can think of, right, given your upbringing. And yet it's easy to pick out the moments in your life where it's just sheer good luck as opposed to bad luck at that moment that determines how things turn out for you. And, you know, nobody, you know, as I often point out on the, on the topic of free will and my, you know, my argument against it, I mean, nobody made themselves. Nobody picked their parents. Nobody picked their genes. Nobody determined the, the environmental influences that sculpted their nervous system and has determined their every brain state up until this moment in concert with their genetics. And so if you're intelligent and are able to use your intelligence in a way that produces great wealth for yourself, well, you got lucky. You, you won the intelligence lottery. And if you have a, a great capacity for effort 
and you know the overcoming of frustration well you won that lottery there are millions of people who won no lottery whatsoever except in seeming to accumulate all the bad luck the universe has to give them and it's through no genius of my own or your own that we're not among those people at this moment and that really can be the kernel around which compassion forms no i, I think you're exactly Right. Uh, you know, I have had the opportunity to sit at innumerable tech conferences here in Silicon Valley, and I cannot tell you the number of individuals in their 20s or early 30s who get up on stage and basically that's what they say. They say, I did this all myself, I, 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 and they forget that, number one, many of the things that have been successful or that they benefited from actually come from tax dollars that have supported them along the way. And two, there's not a single thing that I have done, and I'm sure you would agree you have done, that is not through the benefit, help, effort of other people. And this is the challenge here is that these people actually believe this. And as you go down the rabbit hole of being a libertarian or you talk to people who have that philosophy, or you look at the, you know, the work of Ayn Rand and others, it's as if there's no other person that matters other than self-interest, yet they could not be who they are without all these other people. You know, there's a great uh, video that shows what it's like to have this type of inequality where it shows people on a, a football field and they're going to race, you know, to get to the finish line, you know, and one guy starts basically at the zero yard line and there are all these obstacles set up. And, you know, this is an Afro-American child in poverty. And then at the, you know, at the 99 yard line, there's a child who's grown up with wealth and every benefit. And then they say, go, well, you know, who's going to cross the finish line? And that's the problem is this complete lack of understanding of how fortunate each of us is. And that, as you point out, you cannot, it's not your fault, the family you were born into. You know, they used to say about George Bush, he won the sperm lottery. And this is true of many people. As an example, I have a woman right now in the hospital who I operated on for a spine condition. and. She grew up, uh, again, parents uneducated. She's morbidly obese. She has diabetes. She has multiple health problems. And now she has problems in her spine. And none of this is her fault per se. And then you look at other people who have every advantage and, you know, tout this as if, well, I'm self-made. And it's, it's a very, very unfair comparison to make at all. And this is why being more compassionate, being more thoughtful about your benefits, what has helped you. And again, it's not to also be critical of the wealthy who you know, are in these positions. It's to try to help them recognize, though, how fortunate and how blessed they are to be in that position. And as a result, to have an obligation to be a benefit and service to others. You know, you talk about compassion. It's interesting because so many of the extraordinarily wealthy people, because they live in this echo chamber, want to acquire the next thing to impress their friend. And whether it's a jet, a yacht, thinking that the emptiness that they feel inside that keeps gnawing at them is going to be filled by the acquisition of things. And we know when you're of service to others, when you give to others, when you care for others, it has a profound, profound positive effect on your physiology. It helps every aspect. It decreases your stress hormones. It decreases your inflammatory, the creation of inflammatory proteins. It improves your cardiac function. All of these things by caring for another person, because as we evolved as a species, we could not survive without being cared for by our parents unlike other species who just swim off. It was absolute requirement that they cared for us. 
And when they cared for us, the benefit of those resources and energy is manifested by the release of oxytocin and these other hormones that give you a sense of pleasure and reward. And conversely, those who are benefiting, being cared for, if you will, you know, they understand that that is important and they respond to that. And so, you know, it's, it's, it's a process that has allowed us to survive as a species by caring for others. You know, even as we went into other hunter and gatherer tribes, which was how we lived to the last six or 8,000 years, is when somebody in that small tribe had a problem, was not functioning, you reached out to them and cared for them because it put the tribe at risk. There are all these benefits of caring, compassion. Yeah, there's a, a head-heart connection here that is more than just New Age pablum. I don't know if you want to talk about the vagus nerve and, and sure. what we know about the autonomic nervous system. Yeah, I, I, as uh, you know, I mean, we have uh, the vagus nerve, which is part of our autonomic nervous system, and it uh, begins in the brainstem, and it's distributed throughout all the organs in the body, but especially distributed in the heart. and it's a two-way street. It's not a one-way street. And in fact, we get feedback from these various organs in our body. And how we, again, perceive the world, how we respond to the world has a huge, huge effect on our physiology. As I quoted some of the findings from these types of behavior, I mean, there are some studies that show that being compassionate has more benefit than being at your ideal body weight or exercise. And that's not to say you don't do those things, you just be more compassionate. But my point is that shows you how profound the effect is of these types of behavior. And the other side of it, of course, is that you're just much more happy. Mm -hmm. I mean, you can talk about different types of happiness and sort of the selfish hedonic happiness of buying things and you know uh, what you get from that. But for most people, that's very, very transitory. The thing that gives deep-seated, prolonged sense of satisfaction and meaning in somebody's life is being of service to others. And I mean, that's just reality. So I, I, I wanna ask you, Jim, just as a, a surgeon, as a doctor, what you think we should do and are going to do about our healthcare system in the United States? Because it's, this is, I mean, there obviously there are many pain points and many aspects of our society that perversely leverage inequality, but what you already referenced our failure to provide quality healthcare to everyone as a, as a routine matter, even in a society as wealthy as ours. I don't know at what point this became obscene and masochistic, but I think we've reached that point and, you know, COVID is, is not helping. But what, what explains the fact that we spend more money on healthcare than any other society and yet our outcomes are obviously not among the best? Maybe they're still among the best if you're rich and can shop around for your, your favorite surgeon, but what is the picture of healthcare in the U.S. now, and, and what do you think we should do about it? If you look at the top 10 industrialized countries in the world, the United States is dead last in terms of providing healthcare to its citizenry. And if you look at all the quadrants of efficacy and outcomes, we're typically in the third or fourth quadrant, meaning we're not doing well. And we have the most expensive healthcare per capita in the world and the highest level of dissatisfaction. And interestingly, the nine other countries in the world, the top 10 industrialized countries in the world, actually offer, if you will, socialized medicine. And it's fascinating to hear that, well, we couldn't do that in the United States. Well, of course we could do that in the United States, especially if you look at the cost and we have no true public health system, at least one that's adequately organized. And that's one of the reasons we have the problems on some level with COVID is because of a 
a lack of or disorganized public health system and a president who, for a variety of reasons, chooses not to address that issue, but to stoke uh, controversy. But getting back to the topic of health care, it gets back to this concept that we have of rugged individualism in the sense that there's this perception that if you can't take care of yourself, it's your problem. You know, you need to buy your health care because you have a job, et cetera, et cetera. The thing is that health care is absolute necessity if you're going to thrive in society. And it's ridiculous because so much money is spent in the United States on emergency care, which is exponentially more expensive than care in a timely fashion. Mm. As an example, the three biggest admitters into an emergency department are typically stroke, diabetes, and congestive heart failure. And these disproportionately affect poor people. And each of those admissions, which make up a huge percentage of people coming to emergency rooms, ends up costing hundreds of thousands of dollars weeks in the hospital for the patient versus if you actually gave the medication for free and gave them free care in a health clinic. The greatest source of bankruptcies in the United States is due to unpaid health care bills. I mean, Every aspect of this is appalling. In fact, I had a patient recently who, who died, but, but before she died, she said, well, I was afraid to come in because I don't have health insurance and I knew it would affect my family. Mm. And you, know, you hear these stories every day. So certainly the other aspect is if you look at how much is wasted on emergency care, and what could be done to set up health clinics in the community, you're way, way ahead of the game in terms of dollars spent. The other problem is that we have a system where there are no restraints. As an example, at one time, there was as many MRI machines, I think, in San Francisco as in the entire UK, right? Mm. So you have this immense oversupply. And of course, many of these are owned by entities or agencies that want to make profit, especially physicians. So as soon as a physician group owns an imaging center, there's a dramatic increase in utilization because they get paid for it. Mm. I'll give you another example. Uh, uh, a group of physicians realized that the care of, of prostate cancer in terms of outcomes was just as good from doing radiation therapy as from open surgery. Well, radiation therapy, if you own the machine, you get something like forty to $60,000 per treatment, as well as the professional fee if you hire the radiation oncologist. So they would make significant amounts more. So this group of urologists who were previously in private practice as separate entities joined together buy a machine, become one group so they can refer the patients. And now each of them is making hundreds and hundreds of thousand dollars more. And all of their, or a large percentage of their patients are sent to this entity. And this is the perverse nature of the healthcare system in the United States, where people take advantage of these loopholes. They take advantage of a variety of situations. Another example is in the hospitalists or emergency physicians. Well, previously, it would, the hospital would hire a small group of physicians, either directly or as a, a group, and pay them X amount of dollars. Well, amazingly, private equity has now gotten into this business. So they provide hospitalists and emergency room doctors. But knowing what they know is they know, knew how to rig the system where they maximally charge, they make sure everything is documented so that they can maximally charge. I mean, why would you think any private equity group would be interested in healthcare? Because they can make a ton of money doing that. So you have to take away the advantage of making money 
on the illness of others. And that will in and of itself uh, solve many of these problems. Now, you know, you can look at the public health system in the UK and say, God, it's a mess. They're shutting down things. They don't have enough resources. That may be true. But if you look at a variety of other countries, they have much, much more efficient healthcare systems and are able to get excellent outcomes at a fraction of what we pay. Yeah, I think the concern is if you take the profit motive out of medicine, which is to say, if you, if you can't make a lot of money in any part of it, you have disincentivized all the smart people for whom making a lot of money and having a high status job that's often associated with making a lot of money is at least one of their priorities. They might also want to help people. They might also be interested in the field, but they may be the kind of people who, you know, have the talent to do many other things. And if you're going to say that medicine as a field can't be governed by a profit motive, you're going to attract far less able candidates in the end. You're, you're basically looking for saints rather than, than uh, you know, ordinarily Sinners. selfish people <laughs> who, are, you know, yeah, who are highly competent. Yeah, know? well, I think that is partially true, but I, I, I would beg to differ slightly. First of all, the requirements to get into medical school are arbitrary. And what I mean by that is I don't think there's any statistical evidence that shows that if you have a 3.9, versus a 3.2 that you're a better doctor. Yet, we repeatedly use these different measures to determine if somebody's good enough to go to medical school. I think the other side is, I'm not saying that we make every physician a pauper. I mean, frankly, there is so much money in medicine, it's just being squandered and being wasted. I believe that you can actually pay doctors a actual excellent salary and motivate them. I mean, frankly, what's been happening over the last several years is, as an example, most of us would look at what we call Medicaid, which is healthcare for the poor, the insurance, and then Medicare, and then private insurance, and then HMOs. Well, what has happened is that the PPOs are the private insurance, which would pay you either what you build or a significant multiple of Medicare, is now at the level of Medicare. I mean, we used to, early on in my practice, we would look at Medicare as a loss leader in some ways hmm. because you can't pay the bills unless you had you know, these other patients. Nowadays, there are very, very few insurance companies that will pay much more than Medicare rates. Hmm. So. And this is the entrance into medicine of these companies that are, frankly, taking advantage of the physicians because that profit is there. It's just whose pocket is it going into? And obviously, it should go into the pocket of physicians, nurses, et cetera, et cetera, versus private equity groups and a variety of others. So I don't think if there was a reorganization of healthcare, that it would necessarily de-incentivize quality people to go into medicine. I think, though, we have to really look at who's profiteering and mm -hmm. who's not uh, from a lot of this. Before we close, Jim, I, I mean, you have had such a diverse experience, and also, you know, you have had your own adventures in affluence. What has been your kind of the entrepreneurial side of your? of your life and, and how did that play out? Well, this is probably the most important aspect of our discussion, which is by every measure of quote unquote success in society, I had it. I had a large penthouse in the top of a building in San Francisco. I had Porsches, Ferraris. I was flying around in private jets. I was dating beautiful women and all my friends would say, God, you know, this is amazing. You're having such a great time. And I realized that actually I was miserable. In fact, I was more miserable than I had ever been in my entire life. Just to remind us, how did you get there? Because this is not the usual outcome of just becoming a neurosurgeon. What else did you do other than 
save people's lives uh, to, to get to get to the penthouse and the Ferraris. <laughs> uh, well, I fortunately uh, uh, was an entrepreneur. I had gotten involved uh, when I moved to Silicon Valley with a number of startups. And also a friend of mine had started a medical device company that makes a, a tool called a cyber knife. And I took over that and became the CEO. And so from those various endeavors, I made a lot of money and thus the penthouse, et cetera, et cetera. And here I am, I'm a neurosurgeon. I have, uh, you know, I'm in these different positions of power, if you will. And I was unhappy and miserable and alone. And I couldn't really figure it out. And then what happened is I had made some huge bets in the dot-com period. And when the dot-com crash came, in six weeks, I lost almost $80 million and was effectively bankrupt and about $3 million in the hole. And of course, when you're in those situations, your best friend becomes your banker because he wants to be paid back. Mm. And I had to sell everything. And as I was going through this, I sat back and I was trying to figure out what was it in all these teachings that Ruth taught me what had I missed here? And the reality was that I was never a bad person, but all of my actions, frankly, were to prove I was worthy to other people, whether it was the penthouse, the cars, all of these different things. It was about impressing other people and not about filling that emptiness that I had within myself. And I really had forgotten about that because the lessons I learned from Ruth, I was 12 and I didn't impart all of them. And I went through a period of self-reflection and it turned out that I had actually made some donations to charity of the only stock that I had left, which was this Accuray stock. And as I was going through all my records to figure out what my assets were, but I had given that uh, money away, I had thought. And my attorney in conversation with him actually confessed that they had never completed the paperwork for that. And in fact, if I chose, I could take all of that money back, which was about $30 million. And during this period of deep reflection, I ended up deciding to go ahead and go through with it, mm. which was I ended up giving $30 million away to charity in the face of being effectively bankrupt. Mm. And I had just begun dating a woman who was my, is now my wife at the time. Mm. And actually, the Wall Street Journal did this story about this, which is, of course, this incredible generosity. And my wife made a comment along the lines of, I don't mind him being philanthropic. I just wish he hadn't given everything away. Right. But the more important aspect of that story is what I tell people is here I was, I had everything, but ultimately I had nothing. When I gave everything away, I had everything. What I mean by that is that here I did not have this perception that I had this monkey on my back the whole time that was telling me I wasn't good enough, I wasn't smart enough. And by giving that away, it released me and liberated me, and I was free. And the extraordinary thing about that then is I could be me, whatever that was, without worrying about what other people thought. But what ultimately happened is giving that money away allowed me to do extraordinary things, uh, set up health clinics around the world, create the center at Stanford, endow chairs and promote research at various universities. And in some ways, it was the most meaningful action I had ever done not only to be of service to others, but to also free me from something that was a product of 
my own growing up. So ultimately, and also my wife married me. So mm. <laughs> all of these wonderful things happened. Well, it's an incredibly inspiring story and uh, really quite amazing. You're, you're an outlier in so many respects. And another amazing detail is that you literally have to go perform neurosurgery right now. So yes. uh, you're, you're a busy man, and I really appreciate the time you've taken to 